Okay, so we're now recording. Um, okay, so so uh, so the normal equation only takes us so far, and for really big and interesting data sets, it really is not uh, a practical uh, kind of a solution. And and even with this this particular data set, we're going to do some uh, make some manipulations where the the uh, normal equation isn't going to be able to solve even this BMI uh, type of problem. Uh, okay, so so the, our alternative is to make use of uh, something we've already talked about, uh, which is called gradient descent. Uh, so fundamentally, the, the uh, approach looks like this. We initially just guess at the set of parameters. There are some uh, good heuristics as to how to do that. Uh, and then we uh, compute, we measure the error, uh, the prediction error of the model, uh, compute the gradient of that error with respect to each of our parameters, and then uh, change the parameters so that we reduce uh, our error at least a, a tiny bit. If we take small enough steps, we're guaranteed to do to do uh, to, to do proper gradient descent. Uh, so that's that's always one of the challenges is how to how to choose what that that uh, step size should be, um, but this this process is an iterative one and we repeat until really the error is low enough or the error stops changing. Um, it's unfortunately it's it's hard a priori to to really know what the uh, number of steps we we need. Uh, and it's really unclear what an appropriate uh, learning rate or step size uh, ought to be. Uh, so, so both both of these are often a bit of an empirical uh, kind of a question. At least for linear kinds of models, learning rate doesn't affect things terribly. Uh, and we know that with a linear model, uh, that there effectively is a single best solution. There, there isn't a whole bunch of uh, solutions as in local minima in that error space that uh, have different uh, uh, different uh, uh, mean squared errors. Uh, so fundamentally for doing gradient descent, uh, we've talked a little bit about computing the the gradient, uh, pro the, the process of computing the gradient. Um, essentially, what, what's happening is that for every one of our training samples, we compute, uh, we compute the gradient with respect to that one training sample, figure out what that sample wants as far as changes to Ws. Uh, and then uh, for some number of those training samples, uh, we sum those gradients together and then use that as a stand-in for really, an, an, it's an estimate of our uh, true gradient of this of the error function. Uh, and this, so so this uh, the term batch gradient descent is is used to describe this kind of a process where we take a subset of the data, uh, add the gradients together, and then take a step with respect to that sum. Uh, if if we uh, use all of our data within our training set and that training set is large, then computing that, that batch gradient can be really computationally expensive and may, may actually be uh, unnecessary. So, so there are a couple of, there are a variety of different variations of uh, how we do the, the gradient descent. Uh, process. So stochastic gradient descent, the, this is something that we'll be using here shortly. Uh, the the uh, ultimate version of this is we just randomly select one of our training samples, compute the gradient, and then uh, adjust the parameters uh, to improve our performance with respect to that one sample. And then we repeat that process. Uh, mini bench gradient descent means that we're uh, grabbing not one sample, but a set of samples. We, so that's a batch. We compute the sum of the gradients for that entire batch and then update the uh, the parameters uh, given that gradient estimate. And then 
uh, and then we cycle through our batches. So we've we've cut our training data in, into a set of batches and we do one batch at a time. So this kind of gets, uh, if, if the batch size is big enough, then we actually do a reasonable job of uh, of estimating the gradient, even with a small number of samples. Uh, so uh, doing the computation in order to take one step can be a lot cheaper than, than actually evaluating the entire uh, training set. Uh, but again, so this batch size thing, this is yet another hyperparameter that one has to, to choose when, when you're setting up the problem. Um, and then finally, stochastic mini batch is, is another approach that gets uh, that, that is available. Uh, and for this, we don't actually cut the training set into discrete batches, but instead for every batch, we just randomly sample from the, the data set. Uh, and that random sampling is with replacement. So we, we randomly sample uh, M uh, training samples, compute gradients, make an update to the parameters, and then we throw those samples back into the, the bin uh, as we are getting ready to compute the next uh, uh, gradient. Uh, so potentially you could, in this stochastic mini batch scenario, one could uh, actually touch the same training sample multiple times in a row, although the probability can be really low for that happening. Um, okay, so let's... Uh, Let's work on, oh, okay, before before we uh, head over to our um, uh, our example, um, let's, uh, th there are a few things that we want to try to understand with respect to uh, uh, the training process. And uh, so one of those is how many training steps do we, uh, actually need, and this is often an empirical kind of uh, question. Um, when I ref uh, refer to a learning curve, this is a curve that is, say, perform it's me performance metric as a function of step in the training process. So, for example, mean squared error uh, uh, computed on the, the first step, and often that's referred to as epoch uh, an epoch, epoch zero. And then after we take our, our, our step in the, uh, in the weight space, uh, then we repeat that process and then repeat it again, et cetera. And generally, if we're doing gradient descent, um, what should mean squared error be doing uh, as a function of training step? So that's a question to everybody. Should reduce go down. It it should be going down. Yes. So as in particular with our training data. Um, so so in order to in order to see that um, the typical implementation is uh, we might have we might uh, sample a batch, uh, compute its mean squared error. We we do a small update with respect to that batch. We record the performance of. Uh, with respect to our batch uh, from our training set, as well as, and we'll talk more about this uh, soon, uh, as well as an independent data set. So we we just saw an example where our uh, performance of our uh, regression model was really nice for with respect to our training data, fold zero, uh, but for an independent fold or a validation fold, uh, our performance was not so good. Uh, and and ultimately, what we really care about is how do how do we do with independent data? So so keep that one in mind. Um, so th so th again, this is a, a repetitive process here. Um, one of the other elements of sensitivity that we care about is training set size, uh, and uh, really uh, a good question anytime you're trying to tackle. A machine learning problem is uh, is understanding uh, whether or not you have enough data uh, given the method and the hyperparameters that you're actually using, and uh, and it's really easy to get into situations where you don't actually have uh, enough data. So being able to detect this is uh, really important. 
Um, so in the example that we've done already, our performance, again, was really nice for our training set, uh, but the performance was really low for our independent uh, data set. So this is an example of where a, a method is dramatically overfitting the training set and doesn't do well uh, on future data. Um, so one thing to keep in mind here uh, for our particular uh, prediction problem, our model had 961 parameters. So, so 968 is 960 weights plus a bias term. Uh, and fold zero happens to only have uh, 1,100, almost 1,200 samples in it. And this is one of those scenarios where you should start to feel a bit uncomfortable. So generally, unless you're taking other kinds of steps, generally your number of samples should be a lot bigger than the number of parameters that you have. Uh, as, as we get into more complex methods and as you get into deep network kinds of scenarios, there are lots of ways to address these kinds of uh, issues. But, uh, but for these simple models, we, we do need to, to be very cautious. And in fact, in the example that I did, we saw a scenario where this number of parameters is not good enough uh, to actually nail down, uh, uh, sorry, this number of samples is not good enough to nail down uh, good estimates of what these parameters actually ought to be. In part, that's a sampling uh, issue. Uh, okay, so, uh, so dealing with this training set size problem, uh, one approach is to uh, not train your model once, but train the model with a different amount of training data and then ask how the model uh, performs on some sort of independent data set, a validation set specifically. Uh, if, uh, if your model is very sensitive to that training set size, especially as uh, you're getting to the point where you're using all of your available training data, then you should feel very uncomfortable uh, about that. And so that suggests that perhaps we need to go out and get more data, or we need to take other kinds of precautions as we are setting up the model. So this is where we start to get into the topics uh, of, for example, regularization. And we'll get into that probably not today, but we'll certainly get into it next week. Um, if if your model performance is not very sensitive to the amount of training data that you're using, uh, again, as you're around the zone of using what training data you do have available, then that suggests that you have plenty of training data for at least the particular model that you're, the uh, form of model that you're actually using. Um, so, so this is very pseudo uh example of how one might implement a, a training set size uh, kind of experiment. Um, here, uh, I'm making an assumption that the data are in a very similar form to what we've been working with so far. So our data are already cut into some number of folds. Uh, and what we're going to do is ask the question of how much uh, how many folds do I need? Do I need one fold? Do I need two folds? Do I need three, uh, et cetera? So that's what this list is all about. We have some base model that we're making use of. And uh, uh, and then we also have an independent, in this particular case, a validation data set. So this might be in, in our brain machine interface data. It might be the last fold or second to last fold, depending upon how we've set things up. Uh, and then this loop is all about constructing a total of, uh, oh, it's, it's about constructing one model for every uh, uh, data set size that we have in this list here. So I'm iterating over that uh, list, constructing a NumPy array for our inputs and desired outputs. So, so here ins fold colon one, uh, that's, that's going to be a list of uh, uh, inputs for some number of folds, uh, where n tells me how many folds there are. So, so if n at this point is three, then I'm going to get fold zero, one, and two. Likewise, uh, these are our desired outputs. We can concatenate 
those together here. This is extracting again, fold zero one two together before doing the concatenation. So, so in the end, ins and outs now are full NumPy arrays that contain the number of folds that we've asked for. Are there, are there questions about this? Okay. Um, typically- Why are we doing this? What's that? Why are we doing this? We want to understand the sensitivity of our model to the size of our training set. Okay. So, uh, so tip, uh, so typical implementation from here. So, so we want we want to use this base model, um, but we want to make sure we start from uh, essentially a, a ran start from the same point for every one of the models that we build within this loop. Um, so we're going to do a clone operation. The the Python for this uh is uh copy dot deep copy uh and then we're going to fit our our data to our inputs and outputs and that should be a comma there instead of a, a dot so so you've you've seen this uh before once we have uh fit our model then we can ask what the performance is with respect to uh, our training set, so our ins and outs here, but we can also ask what the performance is with respect to this validation data set. And so all that I'm doing here is collecting up performance uh, for each one of the elements within this loop. So, so in the end, perf training will be a list of performance starting with uh, performance with respect to the training set for uh, one fold. Uh, followed by uh, performance of the model uh, that's been trained with two folds, three folds, et cetera. And likewise for our validation set here. One thing that is key is that we're using the same validation set uh, at, at each time each time through this loop. And this way we can actually compare performance uh, uh, for, for our models uh, for example, for training with one fold versus training with 10 folds. How, how, do, how do each of those models do with our uh, validation data? Okay, so other questions about this? All right, let's go ahead and drop over back over to our instance and do a little bit of work um, with stochastic gradient descent. So I'm, for now, just pick one fold. And as before, we're going to look at just the shoulder. And for, for our model, rather than using linear regression, we're going to use SGD regressor. And we've used stochastic gradient descent before in, in the context of classification. Now we're using the same sort of algorithm with, with regression, um, but the parameters here are uh, very similar to one another. Um, one E minus three. So, so, so tolerance here, this is going to tell stochastic gradient descent um, at what point should I stop training if, if the improvements uh, get to a point where they're below this threshold, then then we're going to stop our training process. For now, I'm going to set penalty to none. So 
So that early stopping is is all about uh, uh, telling the algorithm to stop when it gets uh, to to a low enough uh, point. Okay, so let me I'm gonna leave it there and and then we're gonna fit our data. Okay, this is what I get for doing this on the fly. There should be one D array instead of shape zero two. What is going on here? Uh, theta four should be column comma zero, I believe. Oh, you're in, you're right. Uh, it, Missed my comma. Good. Good call. Okay, so now the shape is what I expect. Give this a try. Okay. Now we're making our uh, predictions here. Um, I am also going to um, make predictions with respect to our, that was the variable name. Um, okay, so, so this was that independent, that's fold, fold one here. This is our training data here. look at that same, at least very similar kind of range there. Okay. Oh, did I not extract time six? I did not. Sorry about that. Okay, so there we go. How do you feel about these predictions? This is prediction on our training set. They're better in some areas. It was better than when we were trying to generalize to full one. Uh, still, there's some problems. Let me add one other property here. That might actually do a little bit better. There we go. Okay, so that, that affected our our learning right there. Um, okay, so let's let's um, ask uh, so, so let's actually build a learning curve and this is we're gonna kind of do it in a wonky way because uh, scikit learn does not. Uh, I'll, does not do this for us. Michael, okay. Um, so let's 
so I'm going to define a function that's that's going to um, that, that's going to implement this uh, learning curve. So we talked before about for for building a learning curve, we're going to do a uh, probably in this case one uh, iteration. Then we'll record the state, and then we'll do the next iteration, etc. So. Um, So, so the, so in ins and outs are our training ins and outs. These ins and outs are our validation set. And this is the number of uh, steps that we're going to be uh, training uh, uh, and recording uh, our data over. Um, so I'm going to pre-allocate a couple of different uh, lists. That track the valid the training and validation uh, root mean root mean squared error. Is it? Um, we'll have to define what my eval is. So that is that's measuring performance for our for our training set, and let's do the same for for our validation data sets. Okay, and in the end, we're going to return those two lists. All right, so my eval for right now, we just care about RMSE. Um, so this is going to be trues and the predictions. So we're going to return that that is that's some squared error. And we need to divide by the number of items that we have. And since the, the we're dealing with radians here, for our purposes, let's convert uh, to degrees. OK, did I get that right? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take our SDD regressor here. The only thing I'm going to change with this uh, is that I'm going to set Ada down a lot smaller, an order of magnitude smaller, and I am going to uh, set a property called Warm Start uh, to true. And um, what this uh, warm start says is that 
uh, as I, by, by default, if I call model.fit on, uh, uh, on a, a model, what it's going to initially do is reset all of the parameters to random values, and then it's going to go through the fitting process. Uh, what WarmStart does is it says, the first time I create the model, I'll set all the parameters randomly. But if I've done a model.fit before, and then I do another model.fit, I'm going to start from where I was at the uh, for, at the end of the last fit. Um, so so one model.fit is going to build on top of what the, the previous one has done. Um, also by uh, setting, let's see, max iter, we need to set, I, I guess I need to set max iter down. I'm going to set it down to 10. So we're going to do, so each time through this loop, uh, we're going to take 10 steps in this model.fit, and then we're going to measure performance and log it, and then we'll repeat that process. Okay, so let's give this a try. I'm going to go ahead and take 200 steps there. Okay, so any questions about what we're accomplishing here? What's nice about how we've written this loop is that it doesn't really matter what kind of model we've handed to it. We could we we could give it our SGD uh, regressor. We could give it more complicated kinds of things, and yet it still is is going to do its job. So I'm going to let that run. It's going to complain a lot potentially so that's what these warnings are here it's it's unhappy because in the 10 iterations i've given one model.fit it uh isn't able to converge and and so it's trying to give me that warning um i'm surprised i only got five of them here okay so let's let's look at what at uh what our performance looks like. RMSE is in, in terms of degrees. Okay, and there and there we go. So uh, as as we take steps, you can see we very quickly this uh, gradient descent process makes a lot of progress, and then that progress starts to slow down. We actually haven't quite uh, hit an an asymptote uh, here. i if I wanted to keep going, this will ultimately uh, land somewhere around that 2.6 degrees that we talked about before. Um, so I might extend that out by another factor of two epochs if, if we wanted to. Okay, so what questions do you have about what I've shown you here? Could you uh, scroll back up to the the def the two functions we made. My graph does not look like that, so I think I just copied something wrong. Okay. So when we were initializing that SGD regressor, I set max iter down to ten. I set eta zero down to ten to the minus four, and warm start to true. So one of those could make an, a difference. Did you find it? Uh, one thing, but that didn't fix it. So I'm, I'm just gonna. I took a picture, so you can you can move on. I'm gonna see if I can find it. Okay. 
All right, so so there's a big caveat here. And what is that big caveat with this figure? What have I not shown you? Oh, so there's the call. What information am I not giving you yet? So why, why not continue training until this bottoms out, until it asymptotes to some value? So the hint is in this, in this line here. Nobody's going to hazard a guess. I haven't told you told you what the performance looks like for our validation data set. So this bit right here, we have not included in this plot. Uh, except it helps if I name it correctly. Okay, and there we go. So what's going on there? How, how do how do we interpret what what's happening with that new curve? This is definitely audience participation time. There are fifty of you. Somebody, I'm sure, has at least there's supposed to be fifty of you. Somebody should have an opinion. The error is increasing, whereas it's supposed to decrease. We really want that error to decrease, but yes, this from from about epoch 10 or 12 or so out to epoch 200, error is actually increasing. So we had this nice run here where error in this with this independent data is, is decreasing, but then it starts to increase. So this is the point right in here. This is the point where our model starts to overfit. Um, at this point in time, our RMSE on our uh, training set is at about five degrees. For our validation set, it's at 6.6, 6.7 degrees or so. But if we keep training, if, if we keep refining our model such that our training performance uh, continues to improve, it actually is at the detriment for this independent data. And in fact, if we let this run, continue to run for a while, we would end up with a similar solution as to what we saw with our uh, linear regression uh, model. Uh, so the, the one where we're using the normal equation, where RMSE for training set is on the order of 2.6 degrees, but RMSE for our validation set uh, is on the order of 13 degrees. So so this will continue to go up as this continues to go down. So so really what's what's going on beyond this point here is that uh, we are uh, a, really what's happening is from here to here, the training process is capturing the, general shape of the function that we're trying to learn. But beyond this point, we're starting to specialize more and more on the, the training data. And again, that's happening at the detriment of our validation data. So so in this particular case, what so, so this is 
really a classic kind of example of overfitting uh, where uh, the validation performance and the training performance diverge uh, at some point. So, so how could I, how could I fix this? How, how, how could I end up with a parameter in, in the context of this loop that we just implemented? How could I end up with a set of parameters that actually do the best possible with respect to the, the validation set? Anybody want to guess at how you would modify that loop? So there's, there's our learning loop right there. Just, just looking for a general idea here. So in some sense, I'm really looking to stop the training process at this point here. How could I modify my loop effectively to make that happen? Is it the range? What's that? Is it the range? What do you mean the range? Oh, you mean the n iter? You mean I could change n iter to twelve or something? I mm -hmm. I could I could do that. Look, looking at this picture, I could I could do that. But then if I go to do this with a different data set, this point where where validation performance gets to a minimum could end up being somewhere else. It might be out at twenty epochs or 25 epochs. So how could I write this loop generically to detect that, to, to detect the minimum? Uh, if, uh, if current RMSC is greater than last RMSC on the validation set. Okay, if the RMSC for the validation set now is is we could we could track the best RMSE, right, for the for our validation set. And if the if the best if the current RMSE for the validation set is less than that best, then we're going to record the best RMSE and we're going to keep a copy of the model or at least the model parameters. So yeah, good. Thank you. And and so so in this. We we still want to run some some number of iterations beyond uh, beyond the the bottom point because you you'll notice that this is a little bit wavy. It sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. Um, if we do all two hundred iterations, but every step of the way, if we hit something better and record our parameters where we are better, at some point we're going to get to a spot where uh, validation RMSE never gets better. We remember those parameters and now it's going back up. And and so we have that log of of what things were uh, back at the uh, at the best point. And and in fact this is the the kind of approach that we uh, we we actually use in lots of different scenarios. In fact this um, I have early stopping turned on here, it really doesn't matter in this scenario, uh, but for uh, but for the previous, our previous use of, uh, of SGD regressor, where we did a full 200 steps or I guess 10,000 steps, uh, uh, when you turn on early stopping, it will try to find that trough and remember what those parameters are at that point. So, okay, so so that's a little bit of intuition about uh, overfitting. Uh, clearly, and it's in this case, it's really a big concern that uh, the difference in validation set and training set performance is so big at this point, even if we were to stop early, 
Uh, and there are some things that we can actually do to try to counteract that. Um, one of those is if I start using more data for training, so if I if I use five folds or 10 folds, in fact, this blue line uh, will start to come down further. It might, with a, a moderate increase in training set, it might still tend upwards, but uh, as, uh, as the training set gets to a, a certain point, the blue line actually will, in, in the ideal scenario, the blue line will actually end up tracking something close to what the red line does and not turn upwards. Okay, so, uh, so questions about this. So part of homework assignment is the next homework assignment that's about to go out. You'll actually play with a uh, different number of uh, different number of folds uh, for training, and you'll track what the uh, what your uh, performance is on an independent data set as a function of your training set size. And you, you'll learn some very interesting things uh, about that. Okay, so we've got four minutes. What do we want to start talking about now? Four minutes isn't a lot to work with here. It's definitely an opportunity to ask, be asking some questions. Okay, so let me do one other thing then. Um, this will help get you set up also for the homework assignment, and that is the topic of multi-regression. So, so far we've been talking in terms of making a, a prediction. We may, may have some number of features input to your model, but, uh, but you, we're still predicting a single scalar value. With multi-regression, all that we're doing here is uh, predicting uh, a, an entire vector. Um, so uh, the models that we're using, the, the linear regression class, the SGD uh, regression class, both of those, uh, you can actually provide, uh, uh, you can ask it to, to predict entire vectors. And that, and that is specified in, by providing a desired output not as a single vector, one for every sample, but but instead a whole matrix where each row is an example uh, and uh, each column is a different dimension of your output vector. So so the things to keep in mind with multi-regression uh, for, for the linear models that we're talking about so far, the parameters for those linear models are completely independent of one another. So uh, training uh, to so so we might build a model that tries to predict both shoulder and elbow uh, velocity, for example. Uh, in that particular case, uh, the the uh, parameters that you that you use to predict uh, shoulder position or shoulder velocity are completely separate from the parameters uh, that we uh, that that we use for uh, elbow velocity. Uh, the error metric uh, uh, changes just a little bit, and uh, and so it, now it becomes the 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 sum of uh, the errors across the entire vector, uh, or, or or your uh, specific more specifically, it's the sum of uh, the squared errors. So so you for every example for every output dimension, you're going to have an error associated with that. Uh, to compute MSE, it is the uh, it's the the square of those errors, and and then divided by the total number of elements within that error matrix. Uh, for as we get into more complicated models, um, there there can be dependencies between the the different outputs, but that does not occur uh, with the simple case that we have right now. Okay, so. Um, I think I'm going to leave it with that. If there are any other questions, uh, now is the time to ask. And then 
Uh, on Tuesday, we'll be back in the, the uh, classroom and we'll start talking about uh, the limits of our linear regression methods. Um, once I once we sign off here, I'll check on the uh, the status of the national research platform, see where we're at. So hopefully that'll come back online soon. Okay, any questions? All right, have a good day. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you.